Advanced Financial Accounting Excel Practice Problem. In this presentation, we're going to go through a practice problem in Excel related to a consolidation, a consolidation with a parent subsidiary relationship, one where there is not 100% owned, but a controlling interest over 51% owned of the subsidiary by the parent. Therefore, we will have a non-controlling interest we will be dealing with. Our major focus will be on a bond, the bond sale from S to P, from subsidiary to parent. There will be a discount on the sale of the bond we will be dealing with. Get ready to account with advanced financial accounting. Here we are in Excel. We have our information on the left. We're going to be entering that information into the blue area on the right, including our journal entries as well as our consolidation worksheet. Note there will be a slight difference on your trial balance and the one we will be working with up until we make this change. You probably won't notice it. We won't be focusing in on it for most of the problem until we get there, but we do want to point it out now. So in your worksheet, you've got these two numbers or these are the two numbers that will be in the presentation until we make an adjustment to P's trial balance. That adjustment's going to be changing this number from 2,250 to 4,500. We're going to say that's going to be the number here. And then this is going to be then going down by the 2,250. So that's what we're going to have here. It's just a change between these two numbers. In essence, you could think of it as, you know, the company posted interest income to the revenue account when they should have posted it to the in interest income account so this is what uh this is what your worksheet will have it's what we will adjust our worksheet to at a later point when it becomes relevant but we want to keep aware of it now it currently is in the presentation up until that point we make the change at at these two numbers the difference only being between those two let's go back to the area on the left to see what we have we have p purchased a percentage of s common stock on january 1st 2000 x zero p parent s subsidiary that amount of purchase being 70 percent so we have a controlling and non-controlling interest cost was 120,400 the non-controlling interest fair value at the point in time of the purchase 51,600 net assets at the purchase was 116,000 in other words assets minus liabilities or equity at the point in time of purchase January 1st 2000 x0 book value and fair value of assets and liabilities are the same except for so if we went through the book value the accounts assets and liabilities at the time of purchase same except for equipment is going to be greater by the 56,000 the life remaining for that equipment we will be using to depreciate it 14 years January 1st 2000 x1 s subsidiary sold bonds to p parent so that we have this intercompany or, or um, parent subsidiary relationship transaction for bonds par value 50,000 percent eight percent years 10 year uh, cash received 45000 Therefore, cash received less than the par value. We have now a discount we will be dealing with rather than a premium. Interest paid on January 1st and July 1st. Therefore, this is not interest paid yearly, but now semi-annually payments of interest. So we'll have to deal with that. January 1st, 2000 X1, S sold land to P uh, for the cost of 24000 and the sales price of 32000 Fully adjusted equity method is going to be used. The consolidation is going to take place as of December 31st, 2000X2. Therefore, this is our information for P and S trial balances as of that point of consolidation, December 31st, 2000X2. And remember, the, the purchase took place in January oh, X1. So that's kind of, that's about th that's three years there. Straight line amortization of the bond. Uh, the bond amounts is what we're going to be using. Okay, so first we want to think about these entries. We want to zero in on the equity method. We're going to look at the equity method to see how we construct this account like we typically do. And we also want to think about the current year uh, uh, transactions related to the bonds. So obviously we're focusing on this account. We're focusing on the bonds payable. And then let's think about the current year transactions, which will deal with the interest and uh, expenses. So I'm going to hide these cells so we can hide from H. I'm going to go from H to K. H to K. Right click and let's hide those. Then I'm going to uh, highlight what we will be working on. I'm going to make these like green or something. Let's do the bonds. That's the ones we want. Oh, I'm moving them. Don't move them. I'm going to be just making them green. So I'm going to select them. Make them green. Okay. So we have S sold bonds to P. So S is the subsidiary, uh, P is the parent. So if we consider what is happening as of the current date that we are going to be consolidating, which is going to be 
uh, 2000X2, the bond sale happened then last year. We could see it happen in 2000X1. It went from S to P. That means S is the, is the one issuing the bonds. So they're the ones that are basically issuing, uh, kind of receiving the money and issuing the bonds. So we could see on S's books then, we would expect to find the bonds payable on their books and then the discount in this case related to the bonds that have been paid. On P's books, the ones that P gave money to S at the point of time that they basically purchased, you know, the bonds in 2000X1, and they have on the books then the investment in the bonds at the 137,200. So now let's think about this in terms of P's entries and then S's entries. We'll we'll post both entries related to bonds and we'll think about entries related to the equity method we're not going to be posting these to our worksheet we're basically reconstructing what has happened with regards to the intercompany bonds and uh and then the equity method so we can then deconstruct it when we have to reverse those entries or do our consolidation and or elimination entries okay so we have the par value is fifty thousand. we have the percent eight percent the years 10 years and the cash received was forty five thousand. so we have a discount resulting from that now, we also see that the interest is paid January 1st and uh, July 1st. So the fact that interest is paid on January 1st, it's after the cutoff. So we have this kind of cutoff issue that could take place. So we want to just be aware of that. If there's a cutoff issue, we would expect then an entry on P's books related to this bond. If they got paid in January, then the time period was six months prior, basically the whole six months prior to that, they got paid after the cutoff, after December and January. So we would expect then, as we could see here, something like a receivable on the books, interest receivable, that would be an accrual entry, an adjusting entry at the end of December that we, we're now going to reverse for the interest, for the interest payment that they're getting now, but that which, um, which was interest that accrued in the prior period. This is going to be interest income. So we would expect then in the current period that we would say, okay, cash then is going to be going up because they're actually receiving the payment that was accrued for interest that accrued in the prior period. And then the receivable would go down. So, and that would be for the amount we would expect of the amount of the payment, which would be the 50,000 face amount times the stated rate, which is going to be the 8%. And then I'm going to take that and divide it by two because that would be for a yearly and this is semi uh, annual payments. That's going to be the 2000. So that's going to be one item that we would, we would uh, expect with relation to these bonds for P's books. Then we would expect in uh, J January or July, in July, we would, we would expect the normal interest payment. They would receive, in essence, another 2000. So we'd say, all right, then cash we would expect to have seen go up by the 2000. Then the other side is going to be interest income, but we're also going to have to deal with the fact that if I look at this investment account, we see it's at forty six thousand five hundred at the at the end of the time period. We would expect it to be uh, we would expect it to be fifty thousand because that's going to be the amount that will be paid at the maturity of the time period. Now, note that many people are might be more familiar with bonds uh, to do it from the issuer side of the bonds, because that's often what we learn in the accounting side. So it might be easier for you, as we will do in a second, take, to take a look at S's side uh, of the transactions related to the bond and then look at the other side for P. But we want to be able to work it kind of both ways. If I look on P's books, I say, okay, there's 46500 That means, you know, they, they purchased it for less than the face amount. That would make sense. That, that number needs to go up, you would expect, to 50000 by the maturity of the bond because you, you would expect them to receive 50000 at that point which should bring this this number down to zero. So then I'm going to say, all right, so that means that this is going to be recorded and this is going to be kind of like uh, the discount that we're going to remove on the on the other side, right? So, but here we're going to say that that needs to be increased. So it's going to be a debit. We're going to calculate it in the same way that we would basically calculate in the discount. So I'm going to say equals. I'm going to put brackets here. I'm going to say it's going to be the 50,000 minus the 45,000 so 50 minus the 45 would be the 5,000 that's the amount of, of the discount and then I'm going to divide that by the number of periods now I'm going to put brackets around it again because I want to pick the number up over here as much as possible 10 would be the number of periods if it was yearly but it's semi-annual so it'd be 10 basically times 2 it's 20 right so I'm going to take the discount which is 5,000 divided by the number of periods which is 10 times 2 or 20 and that's going to give us the 250. 
Then the negative sum on the other side is going to be our plug. That's going to be the interest income. So that's what we would expect to see on uh, July 1st. So I mean, that's going to be the interest income. Let's see if I can pick up the right accounts. <laughs> I, I, I often, you know, income looks similar to the income from S and whatnot, interest income. So I'll try to, we'll pick up the right accounts here. Be careful with those. It's kind of tricky. Then lastly, we're going to have a similar kind of transaction that we had at the beginning to end up with this receivable because the next payment's going to happen on January of the next year. So we're going to have a, an accrual that's going to happen. We didn't get the money yet, in other words, but we're going to set, have a similar thing. We're going to say, well, then accounts receivable is going to go back up or interest receivable. That's where this 2000 currently would be on the books for, for another 2000 because we haven't received it yet, but we've accrued it. And then you're going to say, well, and the rest of this entry would look the same. You're going to say, and the 250 would be here. And then we'd have the negative sum here. So that's what you would expect to see uh, on P side for the, for the bond. Now let's think about just the normal equity method, just to do our normal equity method thing for P side. We're now kind of looking into these two accounts. These two accounts are what we're considering. So let's say, all right, and let's put it down here a little bit. Let's make a little bit of room. Let's put it down here. Okay, I'm going to say this is going to be equal to, and we're going to say typically the uh, investment account is going to be going up, and, the, and then the income from S. And that's going to be for P's portion of S's net income. So I'm going to say here's S's net income. I'm going to say negative of the 45,000 S's net income, revenue minus expenses, times their percentage, which is the 70%. And that's going to be the 31.5 and the 31.5. Then we're typically going to have the transaction related to the dividends, which is going to be equal to the cash. Cash will typically go up. And the other side will typically be going to the investment in the stock investment in the stock for their portion of the dividends issued by s which is nine thousand so i'm going to pick that nine thousand times the seventy percent and that's going to be our our item related to it and then for the fully adjusted equity method we also want to consider this this change that we had here the equipment that is going to be fifty six thousand higher and have a 14 year useful life means that there's going to be an effect on the uh, depreciation which will have an effect as well once we do the consolidation so we want to record that as well that's going to be going to the income uh, from s that's going to be basically decreasing the income from s and then the other side is going to be in the investment in the stock so if we were then to calculate that it would typically be the fifty-six thousand increase in the equipment divided by the useful life to get our depreciation for that year and then we're going to take our portion of it because we're calculating the our effect as p i'm um, considering ourselves p in this instant and that would be the 2800 so then we're going to say all right well that means that if i was to just add these up the income from s and the investment in s what the effect is the income from s is going to be this and then this and so that's going to be the 20 eight seven that makes sense and then the investment is going to be this and this and uh, this that's not going to tie out here because that's only for the current time period but that's going to be a useful tool for us to to keep in mind now notice up top i've changed this number to instead of interest instead of accounts receivable to interest receivable so we'll we'll break that out in a little bit more detail for interest receivable so it is a receivable but let's make it interest our major focus here is going to be the interest uh, income that we're concerned about up top now let's do the similar calculation down here for s and think about s side of things i'm going to hide i'm going to delete some cells you shouldn't need to do this i'm going to shift some cells up here okay so let's think about this in terms of the bonds related to s's side of things so s is the one that sold the bonds so what's going to happen in the current period well we're going to mirror in essence these transactions up top so this first one resulted in that accrual that we talked about because the payment happened in january even so we had this accrual that must have happened s then should have an accrual on the books for the payable that needs to then you know be paid out in the current time period so we would expect then cash to be received in January, like right at the beginning of the year, and that's gonna, that's gonna, I'm sorry, paid, 
the cash is going to be paid in January. And the other side is going to be reducing the interest payable that we would have accrued, we would have on the books because we would have accrued it in the adjusting entry for the prior period. And that, of course, mirrors this top transaction. Now, let's take the second one and take it step by step, top to bottom. I'm going to I'm gonna just mirror this transaction. I'll make it green right now. I'm going to start with cash because, again, even though it's a credit, it's easiest for me to just kind of think of the other side of this transaction. I'm going to say, well, if they are... Uh, receiving cash then over here we must be paying cash which if that was a debit this is going to be a credit i'm going to put the credit on top just because it's easier for us to think about it that way or for me to do so in any case then the other side this one was uh, going to the investment account now we have our bond over here we've got the discount so the, the next portion is going to go to the discount so we're going to say this is going to go to discount and the amount here this was a a debit so we're going to credit it down here credit it down here and you can also think about this because that discount is 3500 it needs to go to zero so we're left with just the bond payable at the end of this time period because that's what will be paid at the point of maturity and then we're going to say all right then we're going to do the negative sum negative sum of this and that then is going to go to interest expense so we'll pick up the interest expense okay let's look at the next transaction so i'm going to ungreen this one we're basically going to mirror the second transaction here so we're going to mirror this one let's take a look at that and by the way it might be useful for us to add up the effect on the on the interest income so the interest income is going to be this and this and if you didn't put an account here, I may have I may have uh, left this blank. It was interest income. That's going to be this account down below. We're mirroring this one up top. Okay, so now we're going to go down and say, all right, well, then this one, uh, it reflects the fact that we have this item that's not going to be paid till January of the next year, but it has a crew. So we're going to have a, basically our adjusting entry at the end of the year. That's going to be for the for the interest. This was receivable. We're going to have the interest payable. So once again, I'm going to start with that on top, just so we can mirror what is happening over here. And I'm going to say that's going to be negative of the 2000. And then the rest of this transaction will be much the same as this one up top. We're going to have this, this item discount is going to be going down by the 250. And then the negative sum, the negative sum of these items will be the interest expense. So interest expense. And then we're concerned here with the interest expense again, which will be this account and this account that we'll be dealing with. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this blue item down here. So that 4,500 is going to be the effect on the interest expense, which we would expect the 4,500 to be the interest income uh, on the other side of things up top. Now let's unhide some sales up top. So we're going to go up to F here and we're going to highlight from F to L, F to L, selecting F, scrolling on over to L, right clicking the selected area and unhide. So now we're going to be doing our consolidation process. So to do that, let's add up our account. So we have uh, the trial balance for P, the trial balance for S, as we've seen in the past. Let's go ahead and sum them up. Our first step in the consolidation process is to sum them up like this. And then we're going to be copying and I'm just going to paste that formula on down. So there we have that. Now we're going to do our consolidation entries or elimination entries and they will go here. We're going to do our standard original elimination entry. There shouldn't be anything too tricky here. We're talking about the elimination entry that's going to be adjusting for the uh, retained earnings and dealing with this account and this account. So let's do that. We're going to take the, I'm going to usually start with the investment in the stock, but I'm not going to put the number there yet. We'll get back to it. And then we're going to go and I'm going to remove the, the equity section in essence for S. So we're going to be taking the common stock then, common stock. And I'm just going to basically copy and paste that down to get to the dividends. This is a credit. Therefore, we're going to debit it to remove it. So we'll debit it by the 37,000. We have a credit in retained earnings. We're going to debit it to remove it. So we'll debit that one. Then we've got the dividends. It has it has a debit in it. So we're going to have to credit it to remove the retained earnings. So we're going to credit the retained earnings. Then we, we're going to go down to the income from S. Income from S. Now the, it's got the 28000 in it. We will typically calculate it with this equity transaction. Unless we have some kind of table to do the adjusting entry. Which we did not do. We don't have one here. 
we're going to make the adjustment of the 45,000 uh, net income and the, the adjustment of the controlling interest or 70% here. So I'm going to take the negative of that number, the 45,000, multiply that times the 70%. And that's going to be the amount for the controlling interest. What about the non-controlling interest, you may ask? And we're going to say that's what we're going to do next, non-controlling interest. It's going to be that 45,000 times the non-controlling interest percent or 30%. So we're going to be picking up then the 45,000. We're going to do it this way, the 45,000 times, let's say brackets, one minus the 70%, which of course then will be the 30%. So there's the 13.5. Then we're going to think about the, the balance sheet side of things. That's going to be the non-controlling account here and the investment account. So we can think about this a couple different ways. We've got the assets minus the liabilities, green minus the orange, 160,000. We can take 70, 30, break out 70, 30 of that. That of course will be equal to all of equity. If I was gonna select all of equity, that's gonna be that same 160. And of course that's reflected here now, the 160. So however you wanna calculate that 160, that's gonna be what it is. And then we're going to be breaking that out between the controlling, non-controlling interest. In other words, 70% controlling, 30% non-controlling. So let's do that. Let's do the controlling interest first. We're going to take, I'm going to take the, the sum, let's say negative sum of assets minus the liabilities here. Close that up and multiply it times the controlling interest, that being 70%. And then let's go down here and to the non-controlling interest, let's do the same thing, equals or plus the sum of, let's take the equity this time, just, just to switch things up, just to be crazy, wild, and different, and then times, and then I'm going to say 1 minus the 70, and that's going to be the 48,000. If we were to highlight those, we got it adding up to zero. Let's post it out now. So we've got the investment in S. So the investment in S, we're going to post that out. Not going to zero quite yet. We're not too concerned right now. We're a little concerned, but not too concerned. I think it'll be okay. So a little bit of concern, but not, 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 I'm not really concerned at all, really. So then we're going to take the 37. That's going to remove, here's this plus this P plus S to the total. Then we're removing S's portion back to P. Same thing's gonna happen with the retained earnings here, equals the 87,000. Here's P, here's S, total, removing S back to P. Then we're gonna do the same for the dividends. So the dividends, we'll pick that one up, same kind of thing there. Here's P, there's S, there's the total, removing S back to P. Next, we have the income from S. Income from S is gonna be down here. This one we expect to go to zero at the end of the day. It's not gonna happen yet, but once again, we're not fully concerned with it because with, we think we'll take care of it. It's at the 2,800. Then we have the non-controlling interest in S. That's gonna be going down here for the net income. So that's gonna be the 13.5. And then finally, we have the non-controlling interest in the net assets, which is gonna be in the light blue accounts, light blue. That's going to be picking up the 48,000, the 48,000. Next, we're going to go down and record a transaction related to the depreciation for this item over here. So we're going to say that we had this depreciable asset that went on the books. Depreciable asset increased the, the item or the depreciable assets by 56,000. We're going to have to record the depreciation related to it. There's a couple ways we can think about how to do that. Uh, let's think about it this way. We're going to say, all right, I know that the depreciation is going to have to be going up. Let's say, all right, depreciation is going to go up for the current year. We're going to use a straight line method, which is simply going to be the 56,000 divided by the 14. 56,000 divided by the 14. Now, instead of crediting accumulated depreciation, because I'm going to do that next time when I think about the, the balance sheet side of things, I'm going to be breaking this out in this one between the non-controlling and controlling interest on the income statement side of things, which is going to be affected. That's going to be the income from S and the non-controlling interest in net assets. So we're going to say, let's break that out then from the income from S or to the income from S and the non-controlling interest in the NI or net income of S. Then we're going to break that out in according to our percentages, 4,000 times the 70% for the controlling interest. And then I can do the, the, the plug formula, but I'm going to say the 4,000 times one minus the 70% or of course 30% here. 
And I think that'll be easier to see when you look at the Excel worksheet. I'll maybe tell people a little bit more if that's a confusing number. So we're going to then go to it posting this. We have the depreciation down below. Depreciation. We're going to record the depreciation of the 4000 So there's that. Then we're going to record the income from S. Income from S. I highlighted two. I only wanted to highlight one of them. There it is. I'm going to, something's in it. This should make it go to zero because that looks like that number. So that's exciting. So I'm going to say F2 plus F2. Pick up that 2,800. And that does indeed bring it down to zero as expected. And which is good. And then we're going to go to the non-controlling interest in NA or NI. Uh, F2 plus F2. Picking up the 1,200. The 1,200. Next, we're going to say, well, now we're going to put that machinery on the books. So now we're going to increase the machinery on the books for the, the increase in the value at the purchase point. So we're going to say, all right, now let's put the machinery needs to go on the books. This is like the differential. We're going to say that needs to be increased by this 56000 because it was worth that much more at the point of the time of the purchase. And then we're going to also put the accumulated depreciation related to that 56000 up to this point in time, including the current year. That's why we didn't have to record the accumulated depreciation over here. We're going to record it all in this kind of like balance sheet side of things entry. Now, we've already determined that depreciation for one year is 4000 And so we just need to say, okay, well, how much has accumulated since the point in time that the purchase took place? We purchased it in X0 this purchase or you know the purchase of the 70 percent took place not the purchase of the equipment because the equipment came with the purchase of the 70 percent okay and so now we're consolidating as of x2 december so that includes this year so 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 x0 through x2 is three years so i'm just gonna say all right then that means that this has got to be like that four thousand times three years that have accumulated thus far including the current year now we're just going to take that and break it out between our, our controlling and non-controlling interest for the balance sheet side of things, which is going to be the investment in S account and the uh, other side going to the non-controlling interest in NA. In other words, I'm going to add these up or subtract them. That giving us the 44000 which we will then break out 7030 controlling non-controlling interest. Let's do so now. So I'm going to say this is the negative sum of this and this. Close that up times the controlling interest, that being the 70%. And now we're going to do the same thing down here, this being the negative sum of this and that. Close that up times 1 minus the, con the controlling interest, 70%, which of course would be the 30%. So all we did there was take this amount, break it out, that amount being 44,000, 70% here, and the 30% there. Okay, so then we're going to post this out. So let's post that out. Posting. We're in the machinery. So here's the machinery. So we're going to say that's going to be equal to this one. It's going to be 56000 higher. Then there was accumulated depreciation based, you know, related to that 56000 increase for the three years that have been accumulating. Then we're going to break that out to the investment account. So the investment account for the controlling interest. Something's in it. So I'm going to say F2 plus F2. And we're going to pick up that 30,800. And then the non controlling interest down here is the next one. Something's in it. So I'm going to say F2 plus F2 and 13,2. So there we have that so far. Next item we're going to take a look at on this side is, is that we had land that we want to deal with. Now, this land was purchased in 2000X1 and the consolidation is 2000X2. So this happened last year. So we have have the uh, the sales price. It was from S sold land to P. So it went from S to P. Happened last year. Sales price greater than the cost. So there was a gain, but that gain happened last year and therefore is in, in essence, retained earnings now. So we know that there's a difference here. The difference between the 32 and the 4 means that the land went on the books for the, for the purchaser, P, uh, at the price they paid, 32000 And if this wasn't to have happened, it should still be on the books at the cost of the 24000 So we got to reduce the land, in essence, back to that 24000 So to do that, I'm going to start with the land, even though this is going to be a credit to do that. And this is going to be a credit. I'm going to say negative to make it a credit. And then I'm going to put brackets and take the sales price minus the 24000 
and that'll bring it back down by 8,000. In other words, it's on the books for 32,000. It should be on the book for 24,000. So we're going to bring it back to bring it down by 8,000 to bring it back from 32 to 24. Okay, so then the other side is just going to be broken out between the balance sheet accounts for the controlling and non-controlling interest. So we're going to say the controlling interest account will then be the investment in stock, non-controlling interest then being non-controlling interest in NA, breaking those out 70-30. That's going to be negative of that 8,000 times the 70, the controlling interest. And then we're going to say negative of that 8,000 times the 1 minus 70 or the 30% non-controlling interest. So there we have that. That should be in balance. Let's just double check it. It's going to add up to zero. Debits equaling the credits. Let's go ahead and post that out. Here's the land. Going up to land, we're going to be in P7. Within P7, we're going to say that is equal to the 8,000 bringing down the land and then we're going to say the investment account investment account is going to be here so i'm going to say f2 plus f2 this should finally bring it down to zero which is a moment we have been long waiting for and uh, so now we can breathe a sigh of relief accomplishment done there and then we're going to say here in the non-controlling interest in a f2 plus f2 that's going to be the 2400 that will then put us back in balance. Now we're going to do the transaction related to the intercompany bonds that we have. And we could, we could break this at this point out into like kind of two components to it. We could look at the balance sheet and then uh, the income statement side of things. So let's do that. We're going to say, all right, if I just look at the trial balance, I could say, okay, well, here's the bonds that we have on the books that I need to remove because I know these are intercompany bonds as well as these discounts. So we're going to remove those. And then on the other side, on P's side of things, we know that we have this investment. We should remove those. And if I was to hold down control and select those cells, they add up to zero. So we're going to say, all right, I, that's one side I can kind of think of right now the way this is currently formatted. So I can say, all right, I know this bonds payable is on the books at a credit. So we're going to debit the bonds payable for the amount on the books. This is the face amount of the bonds because it's it ha has not gone down. Then we have the discount on the bonds payable. Now, if you could see the discount, of course, if this is the only bonds on the books, so we know what the discount is. Uh, in future problems, we'll calculate what the you know what the discount uh, might be at a later time if there was more than one item in it. Of course, in practice, you probably have uh, sub ledgers that would be accounting for what is included in these items and tracking if there's multiple you know bonds being included in the bonds payable and whatnot. So then I'm going to say that uh, this is on the books as a uh, debit. So we're going to credit it to remove it. Then the investment, the investment in the bonds is on the books as a debit. So we're going to credit it to remove it. Let's go ahead and post that out. So here's the bonds payable. Bonds payable is here. We're going to go into the adjusting column and be removing the 50,000 so there's still bonds payable on the books but these are supposedly hopefully not intercompany bonds that are on P's books we removed in essence the 50,000 then we have the discount on the bonds payable discount on the bonds payable going to remove that if the bonds are gone there shouldn't be any discount uh, remaining either and then we have the investment in the stock investment in in uh, bonds I should say and investment in bonds that needs to be removed as well so we're going to remove that next we're going to be dealing with the interest income and uh, expense as well as the intercompany receivable and payable so we had if we think about the transactions that took place over here we're going to say there's bonds on the books so there's going to be uh, intercompany interest and expense so if we were to dig down then on the interest income and expense accounts we should you would think get interest income four thousand five hundred and then uh, the expense of course of the same 4,500 for the current time period. We're going to assume that's what happened. Now note, I'm going to go in here and say, hey, look, we only got the interest income of the 2,250. You would think that that would be the 4,500. And I'm going to assume at this point, well, maybe they posted that, that if we dig down on the GL, they posted part of the interest expense to revenue and we should have broken it out into the interest income. I'm going to make that adjustment now. This has already been adjusted on your trial balance but i want to make that that adjustment now i'm going to make it between these two numbers i'm going to say all right this is this would be like an adjusting entry i'm going to say this number should have been four five zero zero 
and this number was increased or too much by the 2250, which is half of the 4500. Okay, and so these two numbers I basically just changed. They've already been adjusted on your worksheet, but um, I and I put a little note at the beginning of the presentation so you'd be aware that of of that. And the essence, the idea being there again that they posted the revenue for interest into the normal revenue account. Okay, so then we're we're gonna say okay, we're gonna remove the interest income. Uh, which we can see over here, we can we can calculate it over here in practice. Again, we probably would have subledgers to it, and we we would be digging down, drilling in on the interest income and the interest payments that have happened, and be t saying, okay, who did these payments go to? If they went to S, we should be able to see equal and opposite uh, transactions. In a book problem, of course, we would basically have to do something like this, right? We would have to recalculate the interest income. Now note, we, we in essence just took the interest income for a year, even though it's a semi yearly. So it's paid on January and July. So whatever the accruals are, however the accrual happened, if we didn't do this whole like journal entry, we could just say, well, yeah, it's paid twice a year, but I mean, we had, we had to owe, you know, interest income and expense should be whatever it is for a year's worth of time, whether we received it or paid it, right? And the amortization of the discount should also be basically whatever, you know, it needs to be for that time period as well for that year. So the interest, we would say, okay, the amount of payment would be the 50,000 times 0 0.08. That would be 4,000. And then the discount, the amortization on the discount was 50,000 minus 45,000. 5,000 is the amount of the discount divided by the number let's say of years this time rather than the number of periods the number of periods would be 20 let's take it divided by the number of years because we're, we're trying to think of you know adjusting entry for the year time period so divided by 10 periods that would be 500. you would think then that you'd have the 4000 plus the 500 for the 4500 now you might want to think about that in in terms of a journal entry which which helps me to 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 think about these these items a lot so if you were to think about either you know, the interest income or the interest expense side, then you might want to consolidate into one journal entry, basically a year's type of transaction. Uh, or you could think about the two journal entries. So notice the way we did it up here. We did, we reversed the accrual. We saw the accrual item happen. We reversed the accrual, accrual. And then we saw the item that's going to be affecting the interest income, which is going to be the payment that happened here. And then the second payment, which happened to be going to receivable, but the second payment. You can kind of combine the second two into like imagining one payment if your concentration is on the interest income and calculate it somewhat like this right with one transaction in essence and then you 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 could figure out okay yeah the interest income for the year would be the 4500 that's why the reason i think that's helpful or to do it the same thing down here for the interest expense uh we have this similar mirroring transactions down here interest expense, interest expense, adding up to the 4,500. You can imagine this with one transaction. It might be easiest to think of this transaction because then you could think of decreasing the discount. That's what's helpful to me to, to think about it because then I, I want to know which way I'm going with, with regards to this discount. I know how much this cash is going to be paid. Obviously, for a year, it would be twice that. But then I need to know am I, it's a discount, so the discount needs to be going down and, and be able to figure out that that's going to be a credit and therefore you'll be able to kind of tie into the interest income which if the if the bonds were sold directly from one to the other interest income and the and the receipt will, will be the same now if one of these parties as we'll see in future presentations purchase the bonds from a third party then it'll complicate things a little bit but if the if the bonds were issued directly to one or the other then then it should mirror each other pretty pretty nicely so once we have that figured out, we say, okay, well, now the interest income is going to be overstated over here with a, it's got a credit. So we're going to be debiting it to make it go down by that 4,500. I'm going to be pulling that. I'm going to say, pull that from our, our information from our journal entries over here. And then the interest income is going to be going down with a credit. And I'm going to pull that from our journal entries, uh, the two journal entries for the interest income. All right, then posting those out, we have the interest income equals the 4,500. And then the interest expense is going to be that uh, 4,500. Now, lastly, we're going to be dealing with the fact that we have this receivable and payable on the books. Here we could see it if we break it out between the interest and we don't just group them all into you know receivables, then it'll be pretty clear that you're going to have a receivable 
and a, a payable intercompany receivable and payable. In practice, again, it should be kind of clear because we should have subledgers, even if these aren't the only items in the re interest receivable and payable to tell us what is included there or who the receivable and payable are to. We should be able to run that report and we should find that they would be equal and opposite just as we would with accounts receivable and accounts payable. Uh, in a book problem, however, we might have to look at these accruals and then back into in a journal entry format say, okay, at the end of the day, we would have had this, this accrual transaction resulting in a receivable that would have been back on the book. So we would say, okay, then we'd have that receivable on the books. And then down here, we'd have, to, okay, that's got to be the payable. It's going to be that for that 2000 for that second period payment. It's not, it's not for the yearly payment. It's not for the full 4500 because it's paid semi-annually. Therefore, we would have had to accrue one of the two payments resulting in the 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 accrual of the uh, 2000 once we know what the amount is it's going to be a simple transaction the the payable will be overstated we need to make it go down it's a credit balance account so we're going to make it go down doing the opposite thing to it a debit the receivable needs to go down it's a debit balance account we need to do the opposite thing to it to make it go down the amount then we're going to say is for that uh, 2000 which would be the, the you know the second accrual entry we had i'll pick it up from there and i'll make this uh, a positive number negative number over here and then we could just post that out so we have the interest payable so interest payable is going to be then removing that 2000 bringing it on down back on down to zero and then we have the interest receivable so interest receivable up top there's the 2000 up there equals and we're going to be crediting it to bring it on back down to zero as well. So end of the day, we've got the this account at zero, normal practice, this is back down to zero, normal practice. The bond related balance sheet accounts, whether they be uh, the, the investment in the bonds or the bond payable and the discount, those items to zero for with regards to the intercompany bonds. And then of course the equity section here, representing P's equity section basically in the consolidation removing in essence S's uh, equity section those are some standard things we should be able to check within our practice problem.